eBay Motors is here for the ride. Elbow grease and a whole lot of love transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a drive entirely its own. LED headlights, spoilers, whatever you need. eBay Motors has it at affordable prices. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride every time. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Have you found the keys to unlock your best trip? On a Trafalgar tour, you unlock more than just the world. We give you the key to let down your walls and make lifelong friends. The key to discovering hidden talents and fresh perspectives. From one-of-a-kind experiences to iconic destinations, Trafalgar gives you the keys to unlock your best self. Discover more at trafalgar.com slash unlock. That's T-R-A-F-A-L-G-A-R dot com slash unlock. Tour differently. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night. And welcome to T-Pain's Nappy Boy Radio Podcast. The most fun you'll ever listen to while you're folding your clothes. Now let's get this straight. This is not your average podcast. T-Pain's Nappy Boy Radio is super fun, super crazy. It's pretty much an in-your-face conversation. That's the good thing about us. We don't do interviews. We do conversations. All of my guests, all of my co-hosts, we chill. We drink, we play games, we have the song of the week, we have the creative curse word of the week, as long as you're having fun as our guest. Speaking of guests, each week I'm going to go through my whole contact list and dive head first into the world of music, gaming, exotic cars, tech, strippers probably, doctors probably, probably strippers that are only stripping so they can pay for tuition to become a doctor. You never know. My wife is a certified bartender. She'll make you a drink while you're here. We'll get you drunk and make you play VR after. It's a lot going on, but that's what it's all about over here at T-Pain's Nappy Boy Radio Podcast. See you soon, baby! Hello, welcome to CarCast. I'm Matt, the moderator, DeAndre, here with Bill Goldberg. How are you? Good morning, sir. I'm, 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 I'm doing well. All right, so we're moving closer to a podcast studio on your end. So today it's a little echoey, but we're setting up some equipment and sound ending material. But I can see you're, you're there, you're in the room. We're just testing things like internet connections and to make sure it works. So... Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe next week we'll get a little. We're gonna get. We're gonna get closer. We're gonna have you connect up with, with Chris to dial in the audio gear, and then. Uh, uh, but it's good. It's exciting. Look, you got a podcast studio. I mean, <coughs> you know, <laughs> you got you got eighty percent of a podcast studio. <laughs> Yeah, if you only knew, man. Uh, all I can say is progress. Progress is good. We're getting there. I know it's echoey, but uh, we're we're slowly uh, slowly getting to that point. So, um, listeners, I'm I'm hearing your complaints, and I'm on my way. I'm we're, getting the, we're getting there. It's it was a big undertaking <laughs> to uh, to get all of this yeah. done. Um, also, let's welcome back Alistair Weaver. Uh, Alistair Weaver from Edmunds dot com. Sort of a part two segment of our Edmunds Best of Awards. Uh, we went through a few of the category winners last week. We've got a little bit more to go over now, and uh, and a couple of other things. But uh, good morning. How are you, Alistair? Good morning. I'm I'm good. Thank you. Not too bad. I do have my microphone plugged in. You do have your microphone plugged in. I think in. as well. We, we tried that, but it wasn't quite working. We're gonna get. We're gonna get there. We're gonna get. It's there. like the Motown. It's the Motown, but a little bit of reverb. It's good. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Bill's gonna start singing. <laughs> uh, getting a little bit closer off to Barrett Jackson pretty soon. It's gonna be pretty exciting to see what's going on over there. Uh, you know, I, I always. Uh, Craig and Carolyn are always so sweet, and they're you know we get an invitation for the opening night gala event, but to to get there and then to spend a week there uh, in in you know out of town in Arizona is is a little bit much. We've got so much going on, and I don't know why this uh, SEMA event always seems to fall on Arizona Auction Week, but there's a SEMA, there's a three day conference that goes on this week. As well, and I'm doing two of the days, and I'm here in the studio, studio doing one of the days. So I'm all over, kind of scattering all over from L.A. to Anaheim to Glendale to L.A. to Anaheim and back. And then 
Uh, I'll do another day of of the SEMA conference tomorrow and then go from there directly to the airport to fly out to Arizona. I'll see you, Bill, out there uh, for Barrett Jackson. So uh, it's a weird little scheduling thing. And I realized when April comes around, uh, we're going to run into that again because April has – uh, the Grand Prix of Long Beach and Fabulous Fords Forever, where we're going to bring the Mustang Mach 1 out to, and a couple of other shows. And they all keep, seem to be happening like on the same weekend. So it's going to be, it's going to be a little bit of, of madness. <laughs> but it's exciting to go out and actually meet with everybody in person. These SEMA events we haven't been able to do in person for a couple of years. Um, and uh, it's been good kind of looking at... Uh, uh, meeting with all these individual aftermarket companies and meeting with them and talking about projects that we're working on uh, and uh, what they can do to help out. Bill, your garage is a big hit for all of the uh, manufacturers that we work with that have been following on social media and see the progress of the garage. And they're like, I saw the picture. They're like, holy shit, I didn't realize the size of the scope. I was like, I know. When you talk about it, each little detail, we're like, oh, it's a garage door issue, and there's a lighting issue, and we've got to move the workbench in. You don't get to see the size and the scope of of how big this project really was. And then when you see the aerial views that you have, it looks like a toy. It like, looks like a toy model, <laughs> right? It looks like a model, but it's uh, it's fantastic. So. We're finally at the point where I, I don't know if you saw my post this morning. We'll we'll do a big follow up on my Instagram Goldberg's Garage channel. But uh, I did a little uh, tire painting in t- inside of the garage yesterday to test the concrete, so that uh, this idea we have of of tire marks all over the place being cleared to see if it'll work. Yeah. And, uh, the the first attempt it did not work. It's so slick in here. Uh, I used the red eye and I, I, you know, it was a, like a brake stand, you know, and the car, the, the, the car pushed all the way out of the garage with the brakes on because it's so slick. The front tires couldn't, couldn't grip. Right. So, yeah. um, I had to bring the six speed out and drop the clutch like a madman. But, uh, yeah, we're finally getting to that point, dude. We had Expel come last week and spend two days doing the interior window tinting and the, the uh, uh, PPF and uh, badass workbench. I'm working out for those guys. And then Lev Rack, obviously, I'm going to say hello to those guys out of Barrett. But yeah, Barrett gives me an opportunity to finally uh, reap some benefits of this three-year-long project. So I'm looking yeah. forward to it. Yeah, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be good to get it dialed in, and uh, and of course that uh, that podcast studio that we're excited about, <laughs> the podcast studio that we're all excited about. Uh, yeah. Alistair, last week we recovered we uh, covered some of the uh, category winners. Um, you've got some more stuff today. What do you want to get into? Yeah, so today we launched the uh, Best of the Best, which is an inaugural award for us. Um, and what we tried to do with this is pick an overall winner uh, from our six category uh, ca- category champions. It's not uh, it's a little bit different to a traditional car of the year because that tends to recognise a car that came out this year. What we're effectively saying of this award is it's the best vehicle overall on sale today. Um, and what we've looked at is not only our sort of test results, but also the kind of the the vehicle's impact, how relevant it is to consumers, and how much it kind of moves the game on. So with all of that in mind, uh, we've named the, the Ford F-150 Lightning as Edmunds top-rated best of the best for 2023. Really? Interesting. Why, why the F-150? I mean, listen, I, I, I was expecting maybe <laughs> something like... <laughs> Um, Tell that to the local dealership that has all seven of theirs returned. That's all I can say. That was a discussion yesterday I had with a bunch of the uh, SEMA manufacturers, the uh, automotive aftermarket manufacturers. Um, I was expecting kind of (laughs) two ends. I was expecting maybe something like Corvette Z06, which is a fantastic hot rod for its price point, I believe. Or maybe something that we maybe not would have expected, maybe something like, if it's even been tested yet, I don't think maybe it's not out yet, maybe like Genesis, like G90, the new flagship car. But maybe that's not even out yet, right? That was at the LA Auto Show, but it's 
That was just more like... Yeah, I think that is. But it, yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's heading that way. I can't remember... Um, so, so why did the Lightning win? Is a very long-winded. Or, or, I think <laughs> why, I get the I get the feel I get the vibe that you're not super happy with the uh, with the decision. No, I'm um, I'm fine. You're with a it. customer. You own one. I I He's do. Flabbergasted that this actually was the winner. Yeah, maybe it'll help my resale value. <laughs> um, Absolutely, I can give you a sticker if you like. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fantastic. I'm gonna put I'm gonna put them all over the car. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, let's let's get into. It. I mean, we've talked about the lightning a few times and why you guys like the lightning, uh, but why do you think it stood out among the other things that are out there? I think the big um, the big deal for for me on uh, for us, I should say, on, on this is that it's still a proper truck. The only real reservation we have around it have as a truck is if you're if you're regularly towing, um, because then it eats the range, and then you enter infrastructure challenges, or if you're really doing big miles. But for the vast majority of truck users uh, across the U.S., it's just a kind of better kind of truck. You've got the you've got the lockable front, which is super practical. It's got more torque than any F one fifty, including the Raptor. Uh, it's super quiet. It's comfortable. It's a, just a really good working truck. And I think that's what really stood out for us that, you know, this is not a kind of, you know, EV toy. It's not a status symbol. It's a, it's a proper, you know, proper working vehicle. And I think there was a big risk with, with the Lightning that, you know, Ford sell, you know, the F-150 remains the biggest selling vehicle in the U.S., and if Ford had made a mess of this, there was a chance that the whole kind of EV revolution thing would, would take a, a major step back. But they haven't. They've actually done a great job. So, you know, it's just a, it's a really significant vehicle. And, you know, you can get into hyperbole about this. But, you know, I'd argue that it's probably the most significant vehicle since the, since the Model T, certainly for Ford. Yeah, I was going to I was going to get into that. I was like, this is a pretty big deal for Ford. And. It kind of seems like it happened quickly for Ford. I mean, I honestly don't know how long they've been developing it, but they went from like, hey, we're going to partner with Rivian and we're going to do a huge investment for them and we're going to share some technology and maybe that platform is going to sort of underpin some of our vehicles. And and then all of a sudden they were like, we're, we're not doing that with Rivian and we have a new F-150 Lightning coming out that's all electric. I'm like, yeah, that kind of came quickly. <laughs> Yeah, there was a big um, sort of strategic shift within the business with a change of CEO uh, where they stopped this idea of let's just put an electric motor in a focus or an escape, whatever it may be, and let's we've actually got to get serious about this. So that's why they initially set up this kind of almost like a almost like a, a performance division for EVs who did the Mach E and then worked on the the F one fifty Lightning as well. So those guys were given license to kind of short take shortcuts, just get this thing done. In a similar way, it reminds me a lot. I used to do a lot of work with Ford Performance in a previous life, and it reminds me a lot of how they operate as well. That they're just given. They're given license to be a bit more uh, fast and loose in their approach. I don't mean in terms of the end product. I just mean in terms of getting stuff done, whereas the big mainstream vehicles just take a, you know, a lot longer to develop. So, yeah, su- super interesting. Big strategic shift. It's like, right, EVs is happening. We need to lead the way. And, yeah, I mean, they're comfortably – I mean, Rivian was first to market, but the Rivian is a different kind of truck, really. It's more of a leisure vehicle. Um, you know, and Silverado we'll see this year, but – uh, you know, not till later on. And then Ram is still, you know, probably next year, maybe the year after by the time it's in showrooms. So Ford's really still in a march with a, with a great product. Yeah, I guess so. I guess they really kind of got in there. You know, in all of the meetings that I've been having, like these SEMA meetings that I've been talking, uh, I've been talking to a lot of people about looking at what's going on in the aftermarket. And yeah, we've had discussions about EV, what's going on there. And a lot of people were asking me, you know, everybody... Well, everybody that I talked to about the Lightning said, how do you like the Lightning? And my response has been, Ford makes a really nice F-150 Platinum. You know, they make a nice F-150, and the Platinum being their their highest model trim is really nice. And mine just happens to be fast and quiet. But other than that, it's not that much different than any really nice functional F-150. You know, and now, you've got the frunk, which is which I think is super useful. It, it is super useful, and I do use that all the time. And it is nice to be able to 
uh, even put a few things in there and kind of leave them in there and have it out of the way and lockable uh, without, you know, someone like looking in, you know, looking through your window to see what you got around, you know, and someone, you know, breaking your window and stealing stuff, which happens in my apartment complex apparently to to, to some people. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and also – and all the onboard power as well. I mean, yes, you can get that with the standard F-150 Pro Power onboard and that, but on the, it, it's exaggerated on the EV. And, you know, we had a, an example recently. We were doing a, a film shoot down in our car park and there was no power, so we actually plugged all the studio lights into the vehicle. And, you know, that's one use, but a lot of construction sites, things like that, the fact that you can plug in power tools, the fact that you can use it for for tailgating. I mean, there's, there's tons of power there. If you're tailgating, you can plug in the, the TV, the sound system, the beer fridge. It's, it's just a lot of clever thought that's gone into it. And I think the interesting thing will be this year with the Chevy and then with the Ram on the way, you know, everybody's trying to outdo each other and everybody's kind of coming up with clever and clever solutions and, and really using the technology to, you know, to to fine effect. And I think that was the big thing for us. This is not innovation for innovation's sake. It's not gimmick. It's not a gimmick. You know, the frunk is genuinely useful. The the power sources are genuinely useful. Um, Yeah, it's just a great vehicle. I I actually did use it already uh, in an interesting situation where uh, uh, a friend's uh, car died, uh, battery died in a parking garage, and... Uh, I went out there with, uh, I went out there with a with a jump box, and the jump box wasn't enough to to get the car started. Uh, but I brought, uh, I brought one of the larger like twenty five amp C uh, Tech battery chargers as well, and I was able to plug that into the power port in the in the frunk hook up the battery, charge it for a couple of minutes, and then it had a, you know, and then while it was plugged into the truck, it was enough juice to 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 fire up the car. The jump box wouldn't get it done, but plugging it into essentially what would be a regular 110 outlet was enough to get it done. So that that worked out perfectly. And I had tools and everything in there uh, to do the swap. So I'm I'm with you on that. You know, over the over the holidays we did this road trip uh, you know, into Arizona and Vegas and Sonoma and stuff. And I would have liked to have been able to do that in in my F-150 Lightning for all of the features that you were talking about. Having that extra storage, having the plugs and stuff available, having uh, a lot of the features of that truck uh, with me. But it, with all of the traffic and, and everything that was going on, that there was, there's just no way even to make a plan to stop and charge – would have never happened. Uh, gas stations, there was lines. Charging stations, there was lines. I, we we drove past that Tesla station uh, halfway between here and, and Vegas, and there was a stack of Teslas just <laughs> going out to the street, <laughs> doing that doing that ride back. And then somebody I was talking to um, during these meetings the past few days were saying that they've done that drive back and forth to Vegas maybe eighteen times in a Tesla and twice. There's been a power outage in that town. <laughs> and, <laughs> and and there was five hour wait to you know with Tesla stacking up. <laughs> so there's a there's a little bit of that potential <laughs> issue is as well. <laughs> it is. It's like I mean I've got to go up to Northern California somewhere near San Francisco, probably on Monday, and then back on Tuesday. It's a bit of a hike. And I said, like, obviously, I'm in a privileged position. We've got a range of vehicles to choose from. And I just, I was like, I can't take an EV because I'm not going to, I haven't got time. I've got to get back, look at the kids. I'm not going to spend like an hour trying to find a, find a charge point. And it's, what, 300 miles there, 300 miles back. So, yeah, I mean, th- this, is, this remains the problem. And this is the challenge for, for Ford. There's nothing wrong with the truck. And I actually think it has enough range as long as people can charge at home. And there's a de- and then if you are going big distances, there's a decent decent infrastructure. And we, I mean, we talk about this every time, right? Yeah. And that was part of the the challenge with giving it this award. But you know, we just looked at the majority of people. The majority of people aren't regularly driving, you know, 300 miles a day. So you know, the majority of people will be will be you know filling it up at night, um, like an iPhone, and then you know using it during the day. And and also the other thing for bear in mind for people. You know, particularly for commercial users, it's it's a lot cheaper to fill it up with the with the electricity than it is with gas. 
and we were having some work yeah. done on the house and I was talking to like the GC who had this massive Ram V8. I was like, all you do is run around v- LA in your V8. You'd save a ton of money on an electric truck. I, I I do agree with that. So that was one of the things that came up. I plug it in in my warehouse and even with the higher commercial rates, uh, it still ends up being less than what we pay for, for gas out here. Uh, uh, Bill, this is a question that kind of came up with a bunch of the aftermarket. My, my, my parents always taught me that you shouldn't open your mouth if you're not gonna, if you don't have anything positive to say. <laughs> no, I, I, I understand. I would what's just going. stay quiet during this whole bullshit conversation, please. I'm just <laughs> gonna stay quiet. Okay, all but- the listeners will love me for it, but yeah, the more I talk, go ahead. But the so the companies that I've been meeting with, right? They're there are the the people we see at SEMA, they, they built their businesses around the automobile, and EV is not quite on the menu yet for many of these <laughs> companies. I wonder why. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, actually, I, I met with one company that does aftermarket tuning. Um, that's their whole business. And they got a Lightning. They brought it in. They put it on the dyno. They hooked up their, their equipment to see <clears throat> if it's tunable. And they came back and they said, yes, it is tunable. And I said, great. Are you going to do something? They're like, not yet, because we don't have any customers asking for it yet. So that, that audience that is doing performance tunes uh, on, on you know, TRXs and Raptors and all the, the Jeeps and cars and all the stuff you see at the SEMA show hasn't quite trickled down yet to something like an F-150 wrapper. I don't know if there's any tuning happening on Tesla, but... They, these guys said that they've put all of those cars on their dyno and plugged it up to their computer and the hybrid cars and everything else, everything in the Ford, you know, Lincoln lineup, they can tune. But they're not going to make a tune just, you know, <laughs> just to do it. They want to make a tune if if uh, if customers demanding it. And they said, we don't know what it's going to happen to the range. We don't know what's going to happen to the vehicle. Does it burn up motors or whatever? They, they don't know that yet. So they would have to test it. But one of the questions that did come up, uh, Bill, was, you know, they understand what we do. They listen to the podcast. They see the TV commercials, the Dodge stuff that you're doing, uh, being a, a, a spokesperson for them. And then they all saw this, the, the Dodge Charger, you know, EV unveiling. They saw the car at SEMA. And, I, you know, so the question – you know, everybody had sort of their version of the question, but it's what do you, what did you think of that Dodge EV? Is it something you would get one day? What's your feeling on the direction of, of I, I guess, Dodge or SRT or whatever, taking that sort of performance brand, you know, portion of the brand and moving it toward an EV? And I said, I don't know that Bill's on the EV bandwagon yet. But he is on the payroll with Dodge, <laughs> right? And 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 we still run a business, so we still want to be able to. Uh, I don't know. I don't think we're going to just kind of. We're not. We're we're not going to alienate our listeners, and don't, nor is Dodge going to alienate their core, right? So, to be realistic, they have to tip their toe in the water, like everybody else, but. How much behind the scenes are they proportioning to the EV world comparatively to the V6 turbo that they're probably going to be concentrating on? And I mean, they, they, there's no question that they have to dip their toe in the water. Like I said, now, is it a reality? None of us know that, but they have to be in the space and they have to be far as far along as any other car company. So. I I don't think the transition is going to close the door on all the people who made the Hellcat motor what it is. I think they're going to come out with something that gently massages the people into the new EV world. But I I personally don't believe they're placing a lot of stock in that area right this second compared to other manufacturers. I think, quite honestly, they would be Foolish not to dip their toe in it, but none of us really know how how far along they've gotten. Um, obviously, we see this truck coming out. Yeah, uh, 
And, you know, I mean, I was excited about seeing the Banshee. And then I go to dinner with a bunch of the Dodge guys. And the first thing that comes out of my mouth is you guys finally freaking made a two door charger. <laughs> and they're like, well, uh, <clears throat> it's going to be four door. It's going to be four door. Of course, it's going to be four door. Right. So, I mean, they, they know what's coming and they know how to massage their audience. I'm just curious to see how they actually do it. Yeah. I'm excited to see it, you know, because they're going to have their, their own way of doing it, but I don't think it's a reality yet. So I don't think they, you know, concentrated on that segment as much as others. Let's just say that. Was that a good way to explain? <laughs> <it>? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I have an additional thought on it, which is, which is this. In the gas world, nobody cares. You know, if you get into tuning a TRX or something like a Hennessy or something like that, nobody cares about fuel consumption, right? Because, okay, it's going to do six miles the gallon. You just fill it up a bit more often. In the EV world, that becomes a different conundrum because then you, you, you've got a, your, inter, your infrastructure, and, you know, Kia just came out with the EV6 GT, which I think off the top of my head has got like 576. It's got nearly 600 horsepower. And we had one in the office. And the problem is it's got 600 horsepower. So that's incredible. And then everybody goes, ah, but the range is now like 200 miles. And it's like, ah, well, I'm a, you know, and so it's, can you tune it? You know, if you could tune it for more power and more range, then that's a winner. But if you can do that, the OEMs will be doing it right. So <laughs> the only thing that you can think about is like improving the aero, improving improving the rolling resistance or just accepting that your 300 mile whatever is now going to become a 200 mile rocket ship. I suppose the, the only halfway house is if you could tune it in such a way that it only really, that you don't overall kill the performance. But that's going to be a big conundrum that simply doesn't exist in the gas world. Right. I, I don't think the aftermarket is going to, even attempt to tune for more mileage. I think, like you said, the 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 OEs are are trying to do that. They're trying to even do it with over the air updates. If the aftermarket's going to tune an EV, it's going to be performance. It's going to be like, here you go, your 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 Lightning does zero to sixty in four seconds. It gets realistically two hundred and sixty five miles of range. If you can live with two hundred 40 miles of range, we can knock that down to 3.7, you know, zero to 60, you know, like there's, there's probably some way to, to sort of, I don't know, sort of reconfigure, uh, how, how it's, it's using the power, how it's ramping on the power. But, you know, in talking with this, with these tuners yesterday, they're like, but we don't know what that does to the vehicle at the, it, you know, in the long run, the longevity of the battery and, uh, the motors and and all of that stuff. Uh, and what happens to the warranty on the batteries, which is the really expensive bit? I would have thought if you start meddling with the motors and tuning stuff, you're going to start invalidating battery warranties, and that could get really expensive. I mean, so- yes, but but also so many of us modify our cars, you know, and consider the warranty and some don't consider the warranty. Like it just – it is, right? And and then people are going to end up arguing, uh, Alistair, um, the same arguments with any other warranty. Someone's going to go, I did a tune. And they go, your battery is got an issue. And then they're going to go, prove that it's the tune. Because if it's – if you can't prove it's the tune, then my battery is still under warranty. If you – you know – uh, it's just, it's kind of the same thing. It's like I put a supercharger on my car, yeah, but my infotainment system keeps crashing. They're like, I don't think that has anything to do with the supercharger. So you know, I think you're gonna have to fix the infotainment system, or the headliner's <laughs> falling down, right? Like uh-huh. it, you kind of have to. You can't just go, hey, I I put wheels and tires on my car. Now my entire warranty is voided. <laughs> you kind of have to equate the uh, the problem with with the modification that you made. I mean. I, I'm I'm guessing. I, I guess the other thing is like just the levels of performance because EVs are so fast. I mean, it was crazy. We're, we're sitting here today. We've got three vehicles with over 700 horsepower on our long-term test fleet. We've got a GT500, which sadly we're about to sell. Then we've got a, a, a Lucid and a Rivian. And, you know, it, it's insane. Like five years ago, you would have never have imagined that. 
Yeah. And so, like, the, the scope for tuning just becomes that much more diminished. I drove into work this morning in a Volkswagen ID4, like the twin motor version. Yeah. You know, th- that thing is, like, insanely fast. <laughs> Way faster than, than like, you practically, you practically use. Um so all of this stuff is then playing playing with the margins, and I know we were planning on talking about the you know Corvette E Ray, but you know that that thing's that thing's going to be insanely fast, and I know that's a hybrid, not an EV, but just your scope for like what is what is more and more performance. If you've got eight hundred horsepower to start with, like where do you really go from there? Because frankly, our Lucid's got eight hundred horsepower, and you can't really use it. Right. Okay. Let's talk about E Ray for a second. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to to get up on it or drive it yet. I know you guys did a video of it. You did a nice review of it. The video looks we haven't fantastic. Driven it. We haven't driven it yet. We've had a we've had a good poke around it, but haven't driven it yet. What are your guys like? Road shotgun or something in it? I don't know if it was like a just a, a an event that yeah that was a that was a uh, they do sometimes this happens where they'll take you out in a de- with a development engineer and uh, take you around a proving ground. That was up in Michigan. Uh, and we've also had hands on with the car down here in um, down here in LA. I mean, it's a it's a it's a really interesting thing. I mean, you keep the V8 and then add an extra motor at the front, and suddenly you've got all wheel drive. Um, you know, and it's going to cost similar money to a to a Z06. So um, yeah, really really interesting car, really interesting strategy. You feel like they built the Z06 because they just wanted to. But the E-Ray is kind of technically the more interesting car and, and I think, you know, points more towards the future. Uh, yes. And and you're so the Z06, I, I don't know. The E-Ray is like 102,000 and the Z06 is like 104 or something like that. It's a it's a small difference, maybe a, a two or three thousand dollar difference. Now, as far as like production numbers and availability, that might be one of the – the the issues or maybe one of the differentiating factors uh between them uh but the e-ray has some of the body work from the z06 it has kind of the the wider fender flares the wider body the bigger side scoop um it, it is nice to have the v8 back there paired up with the with the with the front motor so you still get that nice v8 sound it doesn't sound like the z06 but it does sound like the corvette stingray uh, it's a little bit heavier, but the all-wheel drive and the electric motors make up for that weight. And I, I think, I don't know, you guys haven't tested it yet, but Chevrolet is saying the E-Ray is like a tenth faster, you know, zero to 60 or something than than the Z06. So I can I, believe that from a track. I mean, you get tons of traction from mid-engine, but I can believe that if you've got if you've got the front axle being powered as well, it makes, you know, and also the instant torque of an electric motor, that, that kind of makes sense to me. Yeah. And, and there's no plug-in option on it. The, the engine powers and charges the battery and that's, that's that. Uh, they, now I, I saw in your video that you guys put out that, uh, Chevrolet has some mode in there that, if you're at the track and you're you're really working on the car, the engine will keep that battery charged almost to maximum capacity the whole time you're tracking it so you get the most performance possible. And then around town, it kind of uses it as, you know, it, it uses it when it needs it for performance, but then it uses it to get you, I guess, better gas mile range like a lot of the hybrids do uh, i also like the stealthy bit that you know you wake up in the morning and i remember my old apartment my garage you had my garage then you had like the neighbor's apartment then you had my apartment yeah and if i ever had anything like vaguely fruity i used to wake the neighbor up because as soon as i started the car like his whole wall shook and woke him up and uh and so i like the idea actually you know like you can cruise around the neighborhood at you know, at, up to, I guess at 40 miles an hour, isn't it? And in, in basically in silence. Yeah. But then you've still got the V8. So it's a nice, you know, it's a nice combination. So it's a, I, I mean, if I was buying one as an investment, I'd buy the Z06. Yeah. But if I was buying one, you know, it, it'll be really interesting. If you're buying one as an everyday car, then the, the E-Ray is pretty appealing. 
I kind of like waking up my neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> you live in Venice Beach, so they probably haven't gone to bed. <laughs> right. Uh, somebody, somebody in the garage, I forgot what he's driving. Um, I hear that car fire up every morning. and It always piques my interest. It's like, ooh, what is that? What's going on in there? Joe, uh, Bill, where is your closest neighbor? How many miles away are they? Uh, half mile. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, still, hear still hear the Hellcat. Believe me, they hear everything. That's all good. Yeah, it's odd how how that sound travels sometimes. But uh, you know, you could probably put like flyers on their on their mailbox and be like, "Hey, I'm tattooing my garage floor on Thursday morning." Just a little heads up. <laughs> <laughs> so they're like, "What does that mean?" You know, yeah, the flyer is a seven day week, three hundred and sixty five day you know, deal. So. <laughs> but at least your neighbors got cars as well. Like they've all. They're, they're into it. Your neighbor's got cool cars as well. There's going to be a little meetup at the Goldberg's Garage of just his neighbors, I think. Cars and coffee over there. <laughs> the pot that calls the kettle black, yes. If any of them complain, all they have to do is pull a mirror out of their pocket and look at it. Yeah, look at it right there. Uh, we're, we're talking about the EV stuff and <laughs> Ford's commitment to to gas engine a little while longer and we – you know, it seemed like they were doing it. Maybe Dodge was not doing it, but uh, GM is saying they're investing a bunch of money into their sixth generation V8. I believe it's sixth generation V8. Uh, eight hundred fifty-eight. I'm sorry, eight hundred fifty-four million dollars into a, a, a to a new V8. Now, something that's probably going to power most of their trucks and large SUVs. Uh, for for us, that also potentially means a new crate engine <laughs> in, uh, in, their, in their catalog, which could be kind of interesting. But uh, I don't know. Like, Alistair, do you have thoughts on this? GM investing in another V8? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because everybody's like, all our money's going into EVs, but you've still got a good decade decade to go um, yeah. of selling V8s. And we, we talked about it before that Ford's persisting with the Mustang, which is like a heavily reworked version, but it might be the only, you know, two-door V8 coupe from, from an American brand suddenly. So it might have the market to itself and do really well. So, it can't, you know, they're still shifting a hell of a lot of ice cars and will and trucks and will continue for the next, you know, probably decade or so. So, it kind of makes sense. And also the figures sound astronomical, but everything sounds astronomical in the automotive world. Um, so, you know, on we on we go. And I don't know whether that engine's going global, because obviously, you know, some of this is, we always think about this in US terms, but there's also kind of global a global story as well um, in terms of, you know, electric adoption and that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's, it's just really tough. And I was talking to Chevy's, uh, one of Chevy's VPs of marketing at, at the LA show, and he was saying that they're rationalizing the gas range just because you can't you can't have like a 20 model lineup. So if you've got six EVs, you've got to rationalize your gas your gas range alongside that. Otherwise, you're just trying to market and sell too many different types of vehicle. So there's this big consolidation. But yeah, I mean, everybody's talking about EVs at the moment. It's still five percent to the market nationwide it's yeah. about i think it's about 16 17 percent in california but you know that's not changing overnight so you know there might be a few people waking up and going you know have we gone too soon with this stuff but then there's also the whole problem of investment if you've got to invest in something you've kind of got to invest in the future right and just because they're saying hey we're we're investing all of this money into a new V8 platform. And of course, you know, like we're like, great, maybe we can get it in a performance catalog. We can build some hot rods, do some cool stuff, the latest and greatest version of that. Ford's, you know, Godzilla engine, their 7.3 liter that everyone is working on. And Ford Motorsport uh, is releasing a, a number of different uh, 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 intake manifolds to make that work. Um. It's kind of interesting, and it's not to say that those V8s wouldn't be paired with some sort of hybrid drivetrain, right? They're saying we're making a V8, but they're not. They didn't say we're not doing a hybrid version of this in all of our SUVs and pickup trucks. Uh, well, all the all the Corvette that we just talked about, right? So, the Corvette, uh, right? So a, a version of that, right? They're going to go, hey, 
you know, especially the large trucks and the SUVs, let's put the V8 in there. We know it's going to tow. It's going to have the torque. But we're going to pair it up with, you know, some electric motor someplace or, or – or, and we got a little bit more room for batteries. And we're going to try to get this thing to come out at, you know, 30 miles per gallon in an SUV with some sort of hybrid technology. Um, Alistair, I know you got to run. Uh, uh, appreciate your time. And uh, Edmunds.com is the website. And uh, – uh, yeah, if you well, want to see the top rated stuff, it's edmunds.com slash top rated. Need to get my cell in there, Matt, before I go. Yeah, do it. And uh, uh, give us your social media again so we can give you a follow and tell you how it's we feel about we- you. Weaver, Weaver on cars <laughs> for me or Alistair Weaver on Twitter, but nobody can ever spell Alistair. Uh, Edmunds is Edmunds Cars on YouTube, um, Edmunds Cars on Instagram and Edmunds on Twitter. Uh, thanks, buddy. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll catch up soon. One, uh, we're going to miss you at, at, at Bear Jackson. You got to get out there at some point. You're going to. Yeah, I'm, I'm heading to NADA, so uh, the dealer, the dealer thing in Dallas. So if anybody's down there who's listening, uh, I will be. Uh, I'll be wandering the halls. Yeah, sounds good, man. Have a good trip. Appreciate okay, you. thanks, guys. Take care. Cheers, Bill. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I thought, I thought you were going to say something. I thought you were saying something. <laughs> Why are you all bundled up? Is it cold in there? Are you going to get the HVAC system working? Where's the heat? It's working, but it's not in the podcast room. Oh, I see. So you're just going to... And I can't open the door because they're still working. So. They're still working. Uh, and it's fucking 31 degrees outside. I listen, I got news for you, man. I was getting uh I was getting texts from uh from Courtney Hansen. She's like, I can't wait to see you guys in Scottsdale. And then she texts me back, she's like, Oh shit, it's gonna be thirty three degrees out there at night. I was like, Yeah, it, it gets cold out there at night. And uh, yeah. uh I was like, It'll be nice during the day, but it'll be it'll be cold. It'll be cold that night as we're running from from the big tent to our to our cars. Pack your jackets and your gloves. That's all I can yeah, say. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a handful. Um, I'm uh, hoping to to kind of swing by RM. Uh, RM usually has their cars out on display, just kind of open to the public now. To um, you you have to have a ticket to get into the actual auction because it's not like Barrett Jackson. It's not really a big spectator thing. It's mostly bidders. Uh, and invited guests into the auction itself. But the cars are all out at the Biltmore, uh, the hotel there. And I believe Thursday, Friday, you can um, you can just go over there and just kind of walk around and see. Uh, and it's a, always a, a, a wonderful display, and it's well curated. And it's kind of just spread all out through the front of this, uh, of this big hotel. And, uh, and it's kind of a desert kind of hotel. It's, it, it's nice. Um, I, I don't know if you've made it over there at all. Bill in the past, but I've been there in the past, and it's definitely something that people should stop and see. It's, it, uh, it really is like if you're going to cruise over to uh, to Barachax and even like Friday afternoon, swing by uh, swing by the Biltmore and walk around uh, RM and see what they got going over there. Now, Gooding used to be out there every year as well, but they made a change since the pandemic, and they were doing their online version. They're geared online, I think is what they call it version of the auction um and then their next live auction i think will be at amelia island uh so that's not going to be out there there's other auctions and stuff that are going on out there as well but uh, i would recommend swinging by rm they've always got some really just amazing i mean uh, the the high-end classic cars if you never really got a chance to see these in person this is the great way to go and see it because i'm pretty sure you can go and walk around there for free and it's the greatest collection of the most expensive cars in the world <laughs> and truly where are you going to go that has that i mean yeah. that's the cream the creme de la creme uh, and then to go there and and uh and enjoy the the, the party that is bear jackson is always is always kind of fun as well so uh We've got uh, a lot to do uh, before we head out, so uh, we're going to wrap this show up today. 
Uh, we're going to head back out, go back to work. Another day of, uh, of the SEMA conference. And I'll start recapping that a little bit maybe next week of what's kind of going on. Uh, but it is interesting to kind of spend some time. So what happens usually is after the SEMA show, we run around and we do the interviews and – and uh, we see a lot of the the new parts that are on display at SEMA, but don't get a lot of one-on-one time with these companies, the manufacturers of these parts. Uh, and then after SEMA, now in January, there's this other conference, and it's kind of like this uh, speed dating event where uh, there's about 40 or so, 50 manufacturers in – in a, in a big hotel, and then we run around like every 30 minutes and, and meet with the different – it's all planned and scheduled and kind of sit down with them and say, this is what our plans are for the podcast this year and our project cars. And they say, we've got these new products coming out. Here's a new tuner, and this is – you know, a new supercharger kit or, or clutches for you know the car. Um, I met with our friend Will Beatty, and uh, he, you know, <laughs> and uh, he mentioned uh, he mentioned you. By the way, he said, uh, so he's at is he uh, McLeod now. He's at McLeod, and well known for very very good uh, clutch kits. But they've acquired a company that they've – I guess they've had for a little while that maybe not as well known that makes um, really high-end torque converters for the automatic cars. And he said to remind you that you have one in one of your cars because they work with gearhead. And that was what they needed to handle the power. That's the car that uh, I did the, the, the painting in inside the garage with yesterday. Yeah, I, th- I think it's – I don't have the notes. I think it's FTI. I think FTI is the torque converter that uh, that they put in there. So he was just – he wasn't sure how much seat time you've had in that car and how you like it. But uh, uh, it's, I like it a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> judging by the grin on your face, it seems good. Yeah, and he said uh, he wanted to reach out. Uh, he still has to reach out to you about your Cobra. I think he wanted to do oh, something right. different. Yeah, and, speaking, and speaking of the Cobra, I inquired, you know – I don't know how many people out there have the issue of the with these 15 inch wheels, but getting options wheel options for a Cobra, yeah, uh, that's that's non existent. And I'm trying to do a, a tire package on it. You know, the tires that were on it were 12 years old. I replaced them the other day. I ended up having to go Toyos on them, and the fitment just isn't there. Um, 15 inch rims, it's you have barely no op, barely any options. So I reached out to HRE and I'm expecting a phone call from Tito here soon. And they they, they supposedly have a fix for it. So I'm very curious to hear what kind of options they can give me. Yeah, he, he might he might step up to like a 16 or even a 17 inch. Now when you go plus I one, plus go seven, seventeen would be too big on that car. I mean, it's in the background. Yeah, you can see it's literally right here, and I got the new tires and wheels on it, or no, the new tires on it. Yeah, see? yeah, yeah. I see it back there. Yeah, see the fronts. The fronts are good. The rears still have too much room. Too too much. You know. Yeah. Uh, so I, I just I and I've I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and there just are not tires out there for that 15 inch wheel. So hopefully he can come up with a 16. 17 is going to be too big. Yeah, um, you know um, when we're when we're over at Barrett Jackson, let's uh, let's cruise on over to uh, uh, and say hi to Lance uh, Stander at Superformance and see what he's doing on his variations of Cobras, his 15s, and does he have a 16 and 17-inch, like, wheel recommendation and a tire package to see kind of – because he's got the Cobras and the Daytonas and the Coupes, and they're all kind of dialed in. So he'd be a good guy. I just saw him the other day at the Shelby event, and he said he's going to go out to Barrett-Jackson. They're going to have their big display out there. So Please remind me, and let's go yeah, over there. Yeah, I'll uh, find you when we're out there, and we'll, we'll cruise over and say hi to him as well. But um, – uh, all right, we're gonna we're gonna let you get back at it because it looks uh, uh, cold. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I'll see you in a couple of days at, at Barrett Jackson. Have a good flight and uh, and a safe one, and I'll see you there. And uh, all you guys listening, hopefully, we'll see you guys at at Barrett Jackson uh, or RM or, or or both. So 
Until next time, uh, keep the air in the spare and the bag in the wheel. For the latest updates and call-in times, follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at CarCast Show. If you'd like to write in, fill out the form on CarCastShow.com. And don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes. CarCast is a Corolla Digital production and is produced by Chris Loxamana. For more information, visit CarCastShow.com. You know, I got to tell you, I have so many garbage apps on my phone, I never know where to look for stuff. And recently, I decided to clean house. All the junk and clutter gone. This leaves me with my most cherished apps. You know, the ones that can do it all. Like my Live One app. Music, events, news, podcasts, comedy. Oh, and actual musical stations curated by humans. Not those robots hanging out on Bezos' yacht. All this on one tiny little place on my phone. i become such a fan of the app we here at the Adam Carolla Show will give you three months free. Jump on to liveone.com forward slash Corolla to lock in your deal today. And with inflation at an all-time high, this is a huge savings. Liveone.com forward slash Corolla for three months plus for free. No ads. All month long on Pluto TV, stream the biggest Tyler Perry movies free. Watch your favorites like Medea's Witness Protection and Medea's Big Happy Family. Join Tyler Perry as he goes on a couples retreat with Sharon Leal in Why Did I Get Married? Or Idris Elba and Gabrielle Union in the Tyler Perry directed film Daddy's Little Girls. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands more movies and TV shows available on live and on demand. Download the free Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start streaming now. Pluto TV. Drop in. Watch free.